Hello and welcome to the Night Sky and the Telescope, a new YouTube channel devoted to helping you explore the night sky. In this first episode, we'll have a quick review of the moon and planets for September and focus on some of the night sky sights you can see with just your eyes or binoculars. The evening sky is still dominated by the giant planets Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is unmissable. It starts the month at magnitude minus 2.5, making it brighter than all the stars and is only outshone by the Moon and Venus. However, Mars will become brighter than Jupiter before the end of the month. It's visible from shortly after sunset towards the southeast and is due south and at its highest at about 10pm on the 1st. It'll be due south on the 15th at 9pm and then an hour earlier again, 8pm on the 30th. Telescopically, Jupiter starts the month at 44 arc seconds in apparent diameter, but shrinks to 41 arc seconds by the end of the month. You'll find Saturn just a little to the east of Jupiter, with about 8.2 degrees between them. Right now, both planets are in retrograde motion and appear to be moving backwards through the sky, but the distance between them is still decreasing. That'll change around the 12th, when Jupiter resumes prograde motion and begins moving eastward again. Saturn won't resume prograde motion until around the 29th, and by the end of the month the distance will have closed to about 7.4 degrees. Saturn is also a fine sight for telescopic observers, and only shrinks a little this month. It will start the month at 18 arc seconds in apparent diameter, but will then diminish to 17 before the start of October. Look out for a first quarter moon close to Jupiter on the evening of the 24th. Come back the following night to then see the moon to the lower left of Saturn. Neptune reaches opposition on the 11th, which, of course, means it's opposite the Sun in the sky and therefore at its best for the year. It will rise at sunset, be due south at around midnight, and then set as the Sun is rising. It's currently among the faint stars of Aquarius, and can be found within the same binocular field as by Aquarii. If you've never seen it before, it appears as a tiny, sapphire-like star, but is much too faint to be seen with the naked eye. That said, your best bet is to use a star chart or planetarium software to help you to identify it. Mars is next, rising at about 10pm on the 1st and around 8pm by the 30th. It will reach opposition next month, but it's already an impressive sight, even to the naked eye. It will start the month at magnitude minus 1.8 and will end at minus 2.5. By that time, it will be brighter than Jupiter, which will have faded to magnitude minus 2.4. It will grow in apparent diameter too, starting the month at 19 arc seconds and ending at 22. Telescopically, it's now at its best and won't grow noticeably larger before its opposition on October 13th. The waning gibbous moon pays a visit on the evening of the 5th. You'll find the pair very close together over the eastern horizon from about 10.30pm onwards. Observers in South America will be lucky enough to witness an occultation of the red planet, but the rest of us will need to be satisfied with the conjunction. Uranus rises shortly after Mars. It's currently moving slowly through the barren southern portion of Aries, the Ram, and rises at around 10pm on the 1st and around 8pm on the 30th. Like Mars, it also reaches opposition next month, making this the second time this year that two planets will be at opposition within a 30-day period. There are no bright stars nearby, but you may be able to spot it within the same binocular field of view as the Moon in the early hours of the 7th. If you're an early riser, you can't miss Venus in the pre-dawn twilight. It rises over three hours before the Sun on the 1st and can be found among the stars of Gemini, the twins. It'll cross into faint Cancer, the crab, on the 3rd and pass close by the beehive cluster on the 13th. You can try your luck with binoculars, but the sky might be too bright for the cluster to be easily seen. Look out for a slender crescent moon nearby on the 14th. Earthshine should also be visible on the lunar surface, making this a good photo opportunity for any astrophotographers. Venus will then move into Leo on the 22nd, where it will remain for the rest of the month. Look for it to the upper right of the bright star Regulus on the morning of the 30th. If you want a challenge, try spotting elusive Mercury in the evening sky at the end of the month. It's close to Spica, the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo, on the 22nd, 
but you'll need a very clear view of the western horizon and, most likely, be not close to spot either one. Both will be just 5 degrees above the horizon at 15 minutes after sunset. Lastly, the moon turns full in Aquarius on the 2nd, passes Aldebaran on the 9th, and then reaches last quarter in Taurus on the 10th. It will turn new on the 17th, but try catching a glimpse of it in the morning sky the day before. You might also glimpse it low over the western horizon just after sunset on the 18th. If you can, try scanning the area with binoculars as both Mercury and the star Spica should be nearby. First quarter occurs on the 24th with the moon in Sagittarius and close to Jupiter. That's it for this month. If you liked the video, hit the subscribe button and feel free to comment below. If you're interested in my books, you can find them at tinyurl.com forward slash RJB Amazon US. And if you'd like to come join the Stars and Stuff Facebook group, you can find it at tinyurl.com forward slash SNS Facebook group. Lastly, you're more than welcome to email me at astronomywriter at gmail.com with any questions you might have. Thanks for watching, and until we meet again, clear skies to you.